Hello and welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Sunday the 4th of September 2022, I am grateful to God that I have this wonderful opportunity to share something remarkable with all of us. The topic for today's broadcast is In the Shoes of Job. In the Shoes of Job. The book of Job is about theodicy. Theodicy is a theological word which means trying to explain why God permits evil in the world. You see, because God is good, the problem of suffering, especially the problem of innocent people suffering, the problem of pain, the problem of disease, the problem of danger, accident, and all sorts of things that might happen to people, especially people that we see as innocent or people that see themselves as innocent, requires some explanation about why does a good God permit the problem of suffering in the world. So a lot of people they believe that the book of Job was written to explain why a good God permits evil or permits innocent people to suffer. So we see that kind of explanation through the experiences of Job. Some people might think that Job is a fictional character and not a historical character. Some people might think that the whole book of Job is a parable on how the suffering of righteous people can be permitted by God for his own sovereign purposes. However, for me, Job actually existed. For me, Job actually existed as a wealthy and God-fearing man with a comfortable life and a large family because God had blessed him in that way. If you remember the story very well, the Bible shows us that God asked Satan for his opinion of Job's righteousness. We must remember that the name Satan simply means the accuser or the adversary or the enemy. So you can see Satan's character is exactly what his name conveys. Satan's opinion of Job is that Job loves God only because Job enjoys the blessings of God. Satan therefore accused Job of only serving God because of what he was getting out of the deal. Job was getting protection from God. Job got prosperity and grace from God. Satan believes that if God should take away Job's wealth, Job's family, and material comforts, Job would turn against God. Following Satan's accusation that if Job were rendered penniless and without his family, he would turn away from God, God permitted Satan to do exactly that, to render him penniless and without his family. 
The whole book of Job is about how Job responds to all the bitter afflictions piled upon him by Satan. In the course of his trials, Job complained to God and three of his friends, namely Eliphaz, Bildad, and Sophar, that he was an innocent man and that he did not deserve the misfortunes that God had visited on him. But Job's friend insisted that Job must have sinned and his misfortunes were a punishment from God. In his responses to his three friends, Job described them as useless physicians, ignorant experts, and arrogant know-alls. Let me just pause there and reflect on what we have listened to so far by applying it to our own relationship with God. We see that Satan could not do anything against Job except by the permission of God. When we are in a relationship with God through Christ Jesus, I really want us to know that Satan could not do anything against us except that God permits it to be so. Whatever God permits to happen to us, he permits it for his own glory and for our good. I really want us to understand that whatever God permits, not even in matters relating to Satan, whatever God permits at all to happen, He permits it for His own glory and for our good. A lot of people are very fearful of Satan, and they should be. But those who have put their trust in God, those who have obtained this precious salvation that is found in Christ Jesus, they should be comforted by this important knowledge that Satan cannot touch them at all except God permits. We should focus our life squarely on God. We should focus our prayers squarely on God. We should not be fearful of Satan. Satan says to God, you have built a hedge or a fortress or a defense around Job. There is nothing that I can do against him. That is who we are when we are born again. That is who we are when we are children of God. God has put a fortress around us. We are in the secret place of the Almighty. We are in the shelter of God. We are in the shadow of the Almighty God. Satan has nothing to do with us. Satan cannot touch us at all, except God permits. And it is very rare for God to permit Satan to do anything against us because God loves us. Things happen in life to us. They have nothing to do with Satan. God loves us so much. It is very rare for God to permit Satan to harass us, to afflict us, to put our life in danger. I know that from, from time to time, we all learn that we can be tested by God. But that is very true. Being tested by God is not the same thing as we thinking that God allows Satan to afflict us. The best example I can give us about being tested by God is when God spoke to Abraham. Take your son Isaac and go and offer your only son to me. 
It was a direct testing by God. Of course, we also read in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit directed Jesus to the wilderness to be tested or tempted by Satan. So, temptation is something that God can permit us to have that is different from the kind of tragedies that God allowed Satan to pile upon Job. So yes, we might be tempted by Satan, but God will not allow Satan to pile tragedies upon us. It's extremely rare for God to do that. He loves us too much. Amen. I hope this helps someone. Don't fear Satan. Don't start rebuking Satan when you have a headache or a stomachache. And don't start attributing to Satan the power that he doesn't actually have. Don't think that Satan is as powerful, if not more powerful than God, except that Satan uses his powers for evil. Don't think like that at all. That is wrong thinking. I really want to help someone today. Satan does not have any power over you. God does. The other thing that we can pick up very, very quickly is that Job has a testimony from God that he is a righteous person. Job has what? A testimony from God that he is righteous. When we are in Christ, that testimony is a resounding one. God has a testimony about us that we are righteous. So I really want to tell you, those who stand on their own self-righteousness, like the Pharisees, they are wasting their time. In fact, they are the people that probably Satan does not even need any permission from God to afflict. So, if you are born again, you know very well that you have this righteous standing with God on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. He died for us on the cross. He shed his blood for us. So that when we put our faith in the finished work of Christ Jesus, guess what? His righteousness is imputed to us. Christ, the sinless person, died for us, the sinful people. And therefore, in the wisdom of God, the righteousness of Christ is put into our bank account, is accounted to us. We have a right standing with God only through Christ Jesus. Amen. And then we notice, as time goes on, when things happened negatively to Job, so many people left him. That is life for you. When things happen negatively in your life, people might leave you. People that you don't expect to leave you might leave you. That is life. They might go about spreading tales about you, condemning you, telling people that what you are going through is because you have sinned against God. We see this in the experience of Job. A lot of people, people that Job had shown love to, had been generous to, people that Job had been kind to, people that Job had supported, people whose lives had improved because of the ministry of God through Job towards them. They left Job. They walked away. Maybe that has happened to you some time ago. Maybe it is happening now. Accept it. That is just the nature of life. Now, remember where I paused in this story. There were three friends who came. They came to mourn with Job. They came to comfort him. They were good friends but they were not great friends. Good friends, but not great friends. 
Why do I say that? Throughout the book of Job, throughout the time of his suffering, these three close friends, they accused Job that he was only going through all the suffering because God was punishing him. Because he had sinned against God. Because Job was unrighteous. That is what they kept telling Job. But Job insisted on his righteousness, on his innocence. Because Job knew he was innocent anyway, Job knew that he had a right standing with God. When you have a right standing with God, you will know. Amen. In the times of Job, to have a right standing with God, you will be a person who dedicates your life to serving God 24-7. When you read the story of Job, that was what he did. And God accepted it from him. Job was kind. Job was gracious. Job was loving. Job loved God exclusively. And the fact that he loved God exclusively showed in how he loved every other person selflessly. That is the pattern in the Old Testament. It, it continues to be the pattern today. Jesus says there are only two commandments. The first one is to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. The second commandment is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus says on these two commandments, all the laws and the prophets and the writings you will come across in the Bible, they hang on these two commandments. If you put these two commandments into practice, clearly you will stand in the righteousness of God not on your own self-righteousness. So Job knew this. So Job insisted on it with his friends. But his friends were condemnatory. Let's talk about how Job described those three friends. He called them useless physicians. Useless physicians. We too, in our life, whether we like it or not, there will be people like that who, when we are going through tough times, they are useless physicians. They will give us advice that if we followed their advice, it would only sink more into trouble. Be careful and be aware of useless physicians or useless medics, useless doctors, people who will come and give you advice when you are going through tough times and their pieces of advice would only sink you into trouble. So let's be careful. Job described his friends as ignorant experts. Ignorant experts. These were people who claim to be experts in what you are going through, but they are ignorant of your own condition. They will be applying general solutions to your specific problems. What worked a year ago? What worked a month ago? What worked in a different person's life? They might be giving it to you for you to try. They are ignorant experts. Job also described his friends as arrogant know-alls because from time to time, during the time of his trial, his friends were speaking as if they knew everything about Job. But they were so arrogant about it. They were arrogant know-alls. But they didn't know everything about Job. Only God knows why Job was going through the suffering that he was going through. So I really want to encourage you when people are like that, when they are arrogant know-alls, when they are saying to you, the problem you are in, they know about it, they've seen it all, and so on and so forth, and they are making it to seem 
that you are to blame for everything that is happening in your life. They are arrogant, no alls. Remember today, the topic is in the shoes of Job. I can qualify it as in the shoes of Job, the problem of suffering. In the shoes of Job, the problem of suffering. Well, thank God, there is a fourth friend called Elihu. When you read the, the book of Job, there is friend number four called Elihu. Elihu rejects the arguments of Job and the three other friends. Elihu stated that Job was wrong to accuse God of injustice because God is absolutely good. When you are accusing God of injustice for any reason at all, you are wrong. Why? God is absolutely good. Elihu also stated that Job's other friends were wrong. They were wrong too because not every suffering is a punishment from God. Not every suffering, not every pain is a punishment from God. Remember, when Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, the brother of Mary and Martha, was ill and dying, Jesus said, this death is not for anything but for the glory of God. Remember, when the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, pointed to a man who was born blind, they asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind so that the glory of God might be shown in him. I really want to assure you, when we are going through pain or suffering or anything that looks negative, feels negative, anything that is contrary to our expectations and our hopes in God, and we know in our own heart we haven't done anything wrong anyway, I really want you to know not every suffering is a punishment from God, either in your life or in the life of people around you or in the life of people in general. Amen. May God in his mercy bless our understanding. God uses human suffering to draw people closer to himself. I know that is something that some people may not like to hear. But God, in his wisdom, actually uses the negative circumstances that might befall us, his children, to draw us closer to him. Everything that happens to us is for his glory and for our good. Everything. I've seen this in my life. I've seen it in the history of Living Oak Church. Everything that happens is for the glory of God and it's for our good. Now, in the book of Job, God eventually responds to all the conversations between Job and his friends. God never explains why Job was suffering. So if something is happening to you that you don't like and you are thinking God must come and explain to you why, I think you've missed the point. You've missed the point. You may question God till tomorrow. He doesn't need to explain anything to you when you know everything that he does is for his glory. And if you love God, you will like him to take the glory. If you truly love God, if you truly you are a child of God, you would like God to take the glory in every circumstance concerning you, even when it is painful, even when you don't understand it, even when it is a tragic loss. Point number two, you will also know that it is for your good. You may not be able to explain it, but it is for your good. So we see in the book of Job that God 
does not explain why Job went through the problems that he had. If we had not read about the conversations between God and Satan, we also, we would not know why Job suffered so much. So I will say to you, don't ask God, why am I going through what I am going through? Find the grace to thank him and to say, Lord, I know it's for your glory and it's for my good. This is it. God teaches us through the sufferings of Job that human beings do not possess the profound and bottomless wisdom that is needed to understand all that God does. Through what we see happening in the life of Job, through his responses, through his actions, God is teaching us that we do not have the kind of bottomless wisdom to understand all that God is doing in our life. Maybe this is why people say we need faith all the time in order to walk with God. I accept it. But more than that, we need this knowledge that no matter what is going on in our life as children of God, it is for the glory of God and it is moreover for our good. Amen. It is for our good. May the Lord in his mercy help us. As you will see in the story of Job, finally, God restores and increases Job's prosperity. Suffering may not be rewarded here on earth, but it will always be rewarded. It will be rewarded in heaven where we are going. Yes, we may suffer here and we, we may find that it hasn't been rewarded by God or it hasn't been rewarded adequately by God. But believe me, in the mercies of God, in the economy of his actions in our life, every suffering will be rewarded. When we look at the life of Job, we see that God restores and increases Job's prosperity. God rebukes Job's three friends for accusing Job of unrighteousness. But God also blesses Job's friends when they repent and Job prays for them. In this way, the whole book of Job is about God's bottomless wisdom and faithfulness and that God will always reward the righteous even if he allowed them to experience severe suffering. Job and the problem of suffering teaches us very clearly that God will always reward the righteous even if he allowed them to experience severe and sometimes irreversible suffering. There is the certainty of divine justice. God is faithful. There is the certainty of divine justice. God will always reward the righteous. God will punish the evil and the wicked. That's what the book of Job shows. Okay, I know time is far gone. Apart from these teachings that we can see from the book of Job, how do we apply the life and times of Job to our own personal walk with God, to our own personal experience of God? How do we apply all these teachings that I have summarized? Point number one, stand firm and trust God even when things are not working in your favor. Amen. Stand firm and trust God even when things are not working in your favor. 
you get people who will try and discourage you. In particular, the wife of Job said to him, Curse God and die. But Job said, Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? You see this in Job chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Stand firm and trust God even when things are not working in your favor. I'm grateful to God that I can genuinely say to you, this is my experience. In all the issues of life, when God has given me the grace to stand firm and trust Him, even when things are not working in my favor, it has brought me peace, the peace of God that passes understanding. It has brought me victory in many unusual ways. And I should tell you, miraculously, on many occasions, God has turned my adversity into prosperity. Remember, God will always reward the righteous, and our righteousness is in Him through Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you are going to a church where they are teaching you that because you are in Christ, everything must work for you, everything must be sweet for you, everything must be comfortable to you, for you, they are lying to you. That is not true. Pick up the Bible and read the Bible. You must learn to endure hardship when it comes as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That is the lesson that we are learning to apply to ourselves when we look at the stand of Job. Stand firm and trust God even when things are not working in your favor. A person like Paul the Apostle in Philippians chapter 4 verse 12 to 13 says this, I know how to be empty. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. I know that things change. And I have. And I have no lack. I have moved through this spectrum of pain and pleasure. Of having nothing and having everything. I have moved through it. Paul was saying. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know a lot of people, they quote that in a very wrong way. But the fact of it is, it's about enduring hardship and knowing that you can go through it because you are not on your own. God is with you. You are not going through affliction or suffering on your own or adversity on your own. When times are hard, when things are difficult, as children of God, we are not on our own. We must learn to endure hardship instead of running from pillar to post as some people do, looking for prophets for this, prophets for that, because they have no connection with God and they have been deceived by people who call themselves their teachers. They are men and women of God. I really want you to know, stand firm and trust God even when things are not working in your favor. Hebrews 6 verses 13 to 15. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 15. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because God could swear by no one greater, God swore by himself, saying to Abraham, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Stand firm and trust in God even when things are not working to your favor. Don't walk by what you see. Don't walk by what you feel. Walk by the grace of God, the measureless grace of God in your life. You are not on your own when you are facing difficulties and hardships. Trust God that he will bring you through. Trust God that he will work something to his glory and for your good as you stand firm. Amen. That's what we see with Job. Lesson number two that we can apply to ourselves when we look at Job and the problem of suffering. Lesson number two. When negative things happen in your life, a lot of people will misrepresent God's intention for your life. Let me say it again. When negative things happen in your life, a lot of people will misrepresent God's intention for your life. Be aware of that and be careful. Be discerning. People will come with all sorts of preaching, all sorts of advice, all sorts of encouragement, but often many of them will misrepresent God's intention for your life. They will mischaracterize what is going in your life. Some will even decree and say, we prophesy and decree that this shall turn out for your good. Just tell them, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> Calm down. The Lord in his mercy is walking stuff through my life. The best thing that people can do when we are going through adverse situation is to learn how to keep their mouth shut and just experience the pain with us. I always tell a story about a child who was sent on an errand by the mother on her way back, she met a friend who had lost a marble and was crying. So she stopped and sat in the sand with her friend and cried with her. When they finished crying, they got up and each one of them went home to their different parents. When this little girl got back home, her mother asked her, why has it taken you so long to come back? And the little girl said, I met my friend on my way back. He had lost something precious to her. She had lost something precious to her. And she was sitting on the ground crying. And the mother said, ah, okay, so what did you do? And the girl said, I sat down with her and I cried with her. And when we, are, we had both finished crying, we got up and went home. <laughs> oh, God is good. God is just so good. You need people around you who will not be making great sermons about you when you are going through tough times. You don't need people who will come and be telling you things that they themselves cannot do if they were going through that tough time. You don't need people who will misrepresent what is going on in your life, who will blame this person, blame that person, blame the devil, blame you, blame the government for what is going on in your life. You don't need people who will come and misrepresent God's intention for you, who will say you are going through it because God is going to bless you more and bless you more and bless you more. And you will tell them, I'm already blessed. I don't even want to be blessed more. <laughs> I just don't want this suffering to continue. Don't allow anyone to suddenly become the greatest preacher in your life because you are passing through adversity. Don't let them mischaracterize God for you, mischaracterize his, in, his, his intentions for you, as the friends of Job did. The friends of Job were useless medics, useless physicians, useless medical doctors. They were ignorant experts. They were arrogant know-alls. 
Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Please, whatever you do, don't allow people to turn your situation into a pulpit for preaching a great message. <laughs> Look for those people who can just sit down with you and mourn with you. And if they are going to encourage you, the encouragement will be, may God in his mercy see us through this. May God help us through this. May God who is with us, even in our difficult times, may God sort this out for us. Those are the people you need in your life. I just thank God that with discernment, you can genuinely say to certain people when you are going through adverse circumstances, keep your mouth shut. I know everything you want to preach now, I already know. So don't preach it. Keep it inside of you. All that you want to preach now, I already know. Keep it inside of you. Don't preach it. And God in his mercy will bless you and help you. In the name of Jesus. God in his mercy will bless you and help you. In the name of Jesus. Let's finish. Because time is far gone. Okay? Let's finish. So try as much as possible. When people are around you in your difficult times, don't allow them to preach to you in a way that will mischaracterize God or will misrepresent God's intentions in your life. Finally, point number three. Ultimately, what we truly know about God is what will sustain us when times are hard. Ultimately, what we truly know about God is what will sustain us when times are hard. So, it's not so much the people that you know, it's the God that you know. Your general overseer might be there. Your pastors might be there. Your relatives might be there. Your best friends might be there. That is not what will pull you through. We thank God for their support we thank God for their encouragement. We thank God for their kindness. We need it. But let me tell you this. What will pull you through any adversity is your knowledge of God. Is the God that you know. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32, those who know their God will do mighty exploits. In another in another part of the Bible, in the book of Psalms, he says, who will help me but God? Who will do things for me but my helper, my God? So I'm not saying don't appreciate your general overseer if he stands by you in your time of adversity. I'm not saying don't appreciate your sisters, your pastors, your relatives, your parents. I'm not saying don't appreciate them. But I'm saying, in the time of your adversity, focus your life exclusively upon God. The God that you know is the God who will bring you through. And when anyone is even encouraging you, if the problem is you don't know this God, then your faith will not actually profit from what they are teaching you or saying to you. Ultimately, what we truly know about God is what will sustain us when times are hard. So I will encourage you, when times are difficult, do what I usually do. I go back to God. I remind myself of who He is. I sit down again and thank Him for who He is. He is my provider, my protector my advocate, my strength, my refuge. Come on. <laughs> when you are in a situation that is adverse in your life and you begin to reflect on who God is to you, ultimately, what you know about God is what will sustain you when times are hard. Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, 
and it shall stand at, at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Amen. For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's what sustained Job, that knowledge about God. I, and he shall stand at last on the earth. He shall be there for me. And after my skin is destroyed, I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Amen. That's why when Jesus is speaking about salvation, he's teaching us that, is, that the faith of our general overseer can save us. The faith of our parents can save us. The faith of our brothers and sisters can save us. But our personal faith, our personal knowledge of God, look at it this way. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, help us when we are going through the problem of suffering, when we are in the shoes of Job, may God apply these important lessons to our heart. May we come out of adversity into prosperity. May we come out of pain into comfort. May we come out of defeat into victory. May we come out of lack of resources into abundance of resources. May God do for us what he did in the life of Job. May God help us to apply these lessons. May we be able to say, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, no matter what is happening in our life. Thank you so much. I love you, but God loves you much, much more. In today's topic, in the shoes of Job, the problem of suffering, God has touched our heart. May God apply the lessons that we have learned to our heart, to our circumstances. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast. Until another broadcast, I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Bye-bye.